Okay, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Hunsinger. I'm Director of Communications and Information Technology at the New Jersey Supervisors and Principals Association. And uh, I'd like to tell you I'm very impressed with the conference so far because it's brought researchers and practitioners together to have good conversation about our students. Nancy Willard talked about the digital immigrant as those of us stuck on the information highway in first gear as the uh, natives are going by uh, throttle to the ground. Well, I think when she said, deal with it, one of the ways we're dealing with it is with good professional development. And I'm very pleased today to bring three panelists to you to talk about professional development and how we can make it happen with a lot more than just our innovative people who are leading the field. Uh, we have three presenters, and the first one today is going to be Kathy Schrock. She's uh, administrator for technology and is best known, or I should say well known, for her Kathy Schrock's Guide to Educators. She has partnered with Discovery Channel around 1999 to bring more resources and uh, rich, uh, well-rounded things to the site. She's an author, she's a presenter, she's uh, on the ISTE board, and uh, we'll start off the presentations talking about using Second Life in real-world professional development. She will then be followed by Barry Joseph. He's the Director of Online Leadership Programs at Global Kids. And uh, he came to Global Kids in 2000, has developed great innovative programs in the area of youth-led online dialogue, video games, and educational potential of virtual worlds. It, Barry's topic will be integrating Second Life into everyday uh, curriculum. And finally, we'll have Rob Machiavelli. He's the Director of Information Systems in the Hunter and Central Schools. Hunter and Central has been in the foreground of technology and leadership for many years. And Rob's going to share with us how Hunter and Central has brought together shared decision making, effective professional development, and high quality customer service by talking about some professional development they do there. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy, and she's going to uh, start our presentation. Do you have any fans in the house? We're going to just shake it right up, all three of us. I know we are. You know, those of us from K-12, we cannot shut up. OK, my presentation is called Get a Move On, The Power of Synchronous Online Environments. And this is a much longer presentation um, and dealing with how to use it to support teaching. But this is really about how to use it for professional development. Synchronous online environments have been around since the 1960s. They've most commonly been used by those that were real techno geeks because it was very difficult to use them back then. With the expansion of internet bandwidth, computers that can process information quickly, and a host of new web-based tools, synchronous environments are available to all of us. How can they be used to support teaching and learning? The whole presentation and links and everything, I didn't bring any paper with me from Cape Cod to Baltimore, back to Princeton. So if you just write down that URL, you'll be all set. My name, M-U-V-E, multi-user virtual environment, for those of you who must be reminded. Thumbs up if you're done. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the component of synchronous um, online spaces. I'm going to give you some Second Life examples. I'm going to talk to you about our professional development uh, project called Lighthouse Learning Island. And we're not going to have time for you to support in the instructional process. But any other time you want to listen to me talk, feel free. Second Life has been around um, probably four years now. Uh, I only I came into it a year ago. March was harassed by a person on a Segway and got really scared and shut it off, and came back in in about three months and hung out in ISTE and found bunches of educators and felt comfortable. So the first thing about Second Life you have to get over is the fact that you're going to feel very uncomfortable when you first go in, and actually sometimes while you're in. Kevin talked about some of this this morning. Those of you that, I didn't go quite into this, though. The main grid is for 18 years old and up. 
Teen Grid is for 13 to 17 years. You know what an avatar is. I'll use the word sin or island to describe the land in Second Life. When I say in life, I don't mean in real life. I mean in Second Life. And there's really two good books. One is by Richard Mansfield in the How to Do Everything series. And one is called Second Life for Dummies. Either one is fine. And the Second Life for Dummies is actually a really nice um, color book as opposed to the Second Life, I mean the, uh, the dummies books that are made of newsprint. So either one of those will get you up to speed very, very quickly. When investigating these different synchronous online environments used to support teaching, learning, and professional development, there are various components that they should include. The most sophisticated projects have many of these. Some simpler ones only have some of them but might meet your needs. Here is a sample list created by Primlani and Morningstar in 2006 and they break the components down into these six categories. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go, oh, by the way, for those of you who have never heard me speak, I'm the terminally left brain learner, all right? Everybody else in this room is to the right of me, so I'm very organized and I stick to the script. I'm gonna go through each one of these categories and talk about how Second Life can meet these needs. Communication aspect of these synchronous environments includes things you see there. Audio conferencing, voice over IP, real-time chat or instant messaging, video conferencing, presenter and participant signaling, and moderating controls. Now, how many people have ever done anything in either WebEx, Illuminate, Macromedia Breeze, which is now Adobe Connect? Raise your hand. Okay, those are all online synchronous environments. Bunches of people are together, and they have different permissions to do different things. Second Life includes most of these online components. So there's real-time voice chat, which wasn't there at first, and I didn't like it um, when it came. We all would be typing all the time, which becomes very cumbersome when you really have something that you want to say because you have to type, 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 and enter. Now, actually, we have uh, voice chat, which does get in the way because some people like to talk more than others. There's real-time messaging and instant messaging in Second Life. So if one of your um, friends or colleagues is in Second Life, you can see a list of who's on, just like you can in instant messaging, and you can instant message them in life. There's no real need for video conferencing because, of course, everybody is there already, all right? No need for cameras. We're all there in our little avatars. By the way, I look how I kind of wish I used to look, I mean, how I look in Second Life. But if you see me, you'll recognize me. And I act exactly like I act in real life in Second Life. Um, uh, Kevin said, he's better in looking in real life, I'm better looking in Second Life. <laughs> Users um, in Second Life can signal for attention. I mean, if you're using voice chat, you can just scream, my turn, my turn. Or there are items that are scripted. So if people are sitting in these special chairs, you just hit your up arrow and your hand goes up. And then you can be called on. That's easier than saying, my turn, my turn. The owner of the LAN can control who can access the session. This is always a concern. If my district is paying an expert to come in and present in Second Life, they're not likely to allow everyone in the world to come to that session. So I own the LAN so I can block out everybody but the people in our district. All right? So there is a way to do that. And you can control the media also if you're the owner. If you're the owner of a piece of land in Second Life, you have many, many more permissions to do things than if you're just a, a casual user. Groups in Second Life are like listservs. As you can see, these are the groups I belong to, all educationally appropriate, of course. Uh, my alt avatar belongs to the, no, I'm just kidding, my alt. <laughs> you activate this so it shows up over your head. All right, so that's how we limit things. For instance, if I had Lighthouse Dennis Sharmouth Regional School District, UIRSD over my head, I can limit their land to only people that have that over their head. Um, another way this is used, if you're in Second Life and you join the K-12 educators group, I can, as the owner of that group, I can send you out a notice, whether you're in Second Life or not in Second Life, you'll get it in your email. Mostly those are just reminders about events that are coming up, and don't forget, this is happening then, don't forget this, don't forget that. It's, it's very, very similar to a listserv. The, these tools, these online synchronous tools have collaboration capability, whiteboards, annotating things, sharing applications, desktop sharing, co-browsing, so both people have control and can co-browse, and, and you can give someone 
remote keyboard and mouse access to your computer, which is also very scary when they're clicking around. Collaboration in Second Life works a little differently. There are social and business collaboration when you're face to face and tools for one to one collaboration, but that whole desktop sharing aspect, it's not there. However, co-browsing is kind of easily done, and I'm gonna show you a little clip. So there's a person who's on in Second Life, and I click on her name on the list that's on, and I say, come to me, come to me. All right, so I'm clicking on her name, I'm saying join me in Lighthouse Learning Island. She gets a little note, Kathy Driver would like you to join in, sec in um, Lighthouse Learning Island. She says fine, and bingo, she flies right in. This is ways you take people on tours in Second Life. This is a way you get people who don't know how to get to places in Second Life. You go there and you grab everybody and say, come to me. And all of a sudden they all land right on top of you if you don't move out of the way. So there she is. And then we can just have a little chat. She just flew right in. These tools have presentation and sharing capabilities. Viewing documents, viewing PowerPoint presentations, real-time download and file sharing, survey and polling tools, and session recording for later viewing. Okay, many of those online tools like WebEx and Illuminate and Breeze have all of that. In Second Life, there are a few ways to share documents within Second Life. The most common is the use of a presentation board. So there I am, standing at that little board, clicking while everybody sits there, traditional presentation, except there's people from all over the world there could be this many people there, all right, it's not just one-to-one, -one. and after that, I can break them up into little groups, have them go do a think-pair-share, come back, expert share, all that good stuff that goes with professional development to get people to assimilate the information. How you do that particular board is you take your PowerPoint presentation, you save it as JPEGs, and you load them up into Second Life, you have to pay some fake money to do that, and you stick it on the board, all right? The other thing that's kind of interesting in Second Life is you can stream media from the web into Second Life, but only MOV files. So you could, so I just wanted to show you one, of course this is not really streamed into this, this is just brain on drugs. But I did a public service announcement presentation on how to use public service announcements with your students, and we streamed in whole bunches of winners from public service announcement um, festivals. There may not be the true file sharing in Second Life as there is in some of these other tools, but the sharing of inventory items is very important. In Second Life, you make stuff and it comes in your inventory, you buy stuff, it comes in your inventory, or people give you stuff. And I can give you those slides, I can create a note card with information on it and give that to you, and I can also um, give you new hair if you wanted some new hair. In addition, anything in Second Life can be scripted to open the browser, all right? So there are many sites in Second Life that really all they are, especially the marketing sites, are front ends to the web. When you go to Sony BMG's site, you click on some media, they show you some media, and then you just simply click on go to our site, brings you out. The NOAA site, you're doing this Hurricane Hunter plane, you're flying in the sky, your avatar's flying, you land, you click on a board and your browser opens and tells you more about hurricane hunting. It's very easy to share something with someone. If they are there with you, you just drag it to their head, all right? And if they're not there with you, you open their profile and drag it. So even when Kevin is not on Second Life and I wanna give him something, I click on his name, he's in my friend list, I open his profile and I drag the thing to a place in his profile and then when he comes on, it says, Kathy has given you this. Do you want it? Yes, no, or otherwise. You always have a choice in Second Life. You don't have to take, because some people try to give you really weird stuff that you really don't want. There are any number of survey tools in Second Life. You simply enter the questions in a note card. In the survey box, the user clicks on the box. They answer the questions, and then the answers are emailed to you. So you can collect data from people all the, all the time, even when you're not in Second Life. You can even capture anything in Second Life that happens. I use a piece of software called Fraps, um, which is usually used to create, to uh, capture from video games. So I want to give you a little tour of our island in Second Life. Now, it was a holiday time, 
And what was nice about holiday time is we weren't allowed to decorate the real school, but of course in Second Life we could put all kinds of Christmas stuff. That's why I'm dressed like that, sorry. We all walk like that? All right. Um, it took about three months to be able to turn around and see my face. I never knew what I looked like in the front, only my rear. Uh, those are on the right-hand side are laptops there. You see them? Those are all front ends to websites about using Second Life in education. There's a bunch of resources on that bookcase over there, including a bunch of T-shirts I made. Oh, by the way, I built everything on this island. All right, and I built everything out of little Legos, basically. They're called Prims. So you can see up here we have the teacher's lounge with the Coke machine. Huge copyright violation. I didn't put it up there. It was already there. I figured it was OK. There's the presentation board. All right, not atypical. And then I'm going to bring you over to the. Now, the thing about if you are doing presentations in Second Life, how fast they come in and res and become clear depends on the bandwidth of the person at the other end. So if you have really good bandwidth and you're whipping through those slides, the people are saying, wait, all I saw was fuzzy words, and now you move to another slide with fuzzy words. So you have to be careful. There's the media center, all right? And I'm gonna stream in a public service announcement. I would skip by this, except I wanna show you the next part. I can't make it go any faster because it's captured, sorry. It makes me look tough. Everyone's doing it. It's really cool. <laughs> it makes me look glamorous. One of the things in Second Life, and you see I'm going to go in the backyard in a moment. One of the things when I first went into Second Life is you're homeless. Um, if you go to some sites, you can't sit down, you can't put anything on the ground, you can just kind of stand there and look like an avatar that doesn't have a place to be. So when I first brought teachers in here, the first thing, and I lived on the front steps of ISTE for about four months because I didn't you know, have any place. I didn't have any money, I didn't know what to do. So the first thing I did when I brought my teachers in here was to give them a little house. Okay, once a person, has a, 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 as in my space, it's a place to belong, once you have a place to belong, you feel much more comfortable at using an environment. One of the things in Second Life that's important if you're going to get teachers to use it with students or just for professional development purposes is they have to learn how to build things. So every island, uh, our island has a sandbox, and it's where they're allowed to put down stuff, practice building, and pick it back up and put it in their inventory. We have large group presentation areas, small group presentation areas, my house is there. I figure since I did all this work, I deserved a house. It's a nice house, too. I really live in a geodesic dome. I spent months trying to make a geodesic dome in Second Life and finally said, forget it. Too much geometry involved. Adobe Education Leaders has a uh, building on our island. All right. So that's how that goes. So that's what our island looks like. You notice it looks like a traditional campus. In order to get, my superintendent was really good about it. He created an avatar in Second Life. He didn't tell me the avatar's name. He went to every CD place in Second Life, visited the education sites I told him to go to, and came back and said, fine, you can do your project. Um, but to get teachers involved, they don't have to be traditional buildings on the ground. They could be up in the air. They could be tree houses. They could be flying carpets, whatever. We left brainers kind of keep things traditional. There's no cost to use the main grid as an educator. There's an orientation island you go through, make sure you go through the whole thing so you learn how to walk and talk and spend money. The fake money in Second Life is called Linden's if you want to spend money. And it cost us um, 2,395 real dollars, US dollars, for the purchase and maintenance of that island for the first year. And after that, it's $150 a month. That's actually, and we've used a state, no one's here from my state, a state uh, Department of Education grant. Never mentioned the word Second Life. Online synchronous professional development environment. Got it. <laughs> so, so here's our project, Lighthouse Learning Island. It's four school districts, Nauset, Dennis Yarmouth, Barnstable, and Plymouth. And I've just added, um, I broke the island into a couple of other pieces, and we've added two educational service centers from Connecticut also. The, uh, we, we put it up last June. In the fall, we provided real life professional development for each of our districts, our own districts. 
I had a 10-week professional learning community with my teachers, um, and they went in 10 hours, basically, after school. They went from the point that I wanted them to get to, which was learn how to walk and talk and speak and spend money, to being able to do a presentation in Second Life. That's as far as I wanted them to get. This winter, we've been doing Second Life professional development, how to build, how to script, how to do permissioning. So when they go to the team grid, which they're doing just this week, two of them, they will know how to do things in Second Life as opposed to real life. So you saw the island. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, but uh, this was the, the summative assessment. All um, four of the teachers anyway got all the way through and they actually had to create a presentation about the engaging students using Second Life and they had to present it in life. And we invited the world and that's very threatening for people. So they did a great job. This was an interesting one. So here I am, this is some of the things in Second Life that are good and bad. I'm presenting away about Web 2.0 tools. And I get a little note. In five minutes, this island is going to be reset. In other words, they're shutting down the server and starting it up again. <laughs> I talked faster. And then when zero minutes came, everything disappeared. We all got logged out. All there was was water. And I didn't know what to do. So we all logged back in and it put us in some place similar, it said. Well, it was very scary where we were. So I found a place that I knew I could put a board down on the ground. I loaded up the rest of the slides, because my other board disappeared into the water. And I saw the people were on, and I teleported them all to me. And we continued. So it's kind of like, you know, when you have a fire drill, you want to continue the lesson outside. <laughs> That's what I felt like. So it worked pretty well. We're just joining Scalabrate this week. This is an international group of um, Australia, New Zealand, um, Taiwan, Japan, a school in New Hampshire, a school in California, and our middle school. And um, we're, their project includes a lot of online components too because of the time zone thing. You can't always collaborate in real time when people are sleeping. Our meetings are at 10.30 at night Eastern Standard Time, which is just killer for me. I'm not at my best at 10.30. In order to, do, um, to teach in an online synchronous environment, you need all these skills. In order to use Second Life, you need all these skills also. So the things that I'm leave, gonna leave you with are questions, how can these environments be used? How can you convince your staff or administration that they even wanna do this? And how do you get the money? You just lie to the DOE and it works just fine. And then I just wanna bring, get you to the last slide with the information on it. Okay, you have the first one. The second one, if you wanted to follow our professional learning community, I documented it all the way along. Um, we were one of the first, Kevin, we were probably one of the first districts to do this. And so all the, the, the problems we had are all documented. If you're in Second Life, please join K-12 educators. Slurls are Second Life URLs, which means if you click on a regular URL, it opens Second Life for you. You log in and you go directly to the place. So if you have any cool places in Second Life, I have tons. And if you're in Second Life, look for Kathy Dryberg. Look just like that. All right. Thank you. I plugged in the wrong one. Oh, wow. 
This is actually the subject of what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> There we go. My son. Thank you very much. We thank her. She's been fantastic. Thank you. Hi. My name is Barry Joseph. And uh, unlike uh, Kevin earlier, I think my avatar looks better than me. He has more hair. You know, when I uh, came this morning, I went to the wrong room. It was a room somewhat like this. People looked very friendly, and they were sitting around at another table. But something looked very wrong when I sat down, and it took me a little bit to realize that nobody had a computer out. <laughs> and then when I got in here, I opened the door. I said, yeah, I'm in, I'm in the right place. Um, if anybody did this earlier and I missed it, forgive me. We'll move on. But I want to get a sense of who was in the room. Did anybody do a show of hands, like who, what backgrounds and stuff like that? No? So who here um, is a librarian? works in libraries, and I met some earlier, right? Who works uh, K through 12, directly with young people? Who works administration? Who's, you know, college and higher? Who did I leave out? Who didn't put up their hand? What, would, what, 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 what might you ask to represent your group? I'm a techie. A techie, who are the techies? Professionally, right. Anyone else? No? Anything that you want me to ask because you want to get a sense of the room? Anybody? And I'm asking right now because, because unlike Kathy, and I respect what she said, I don't like to keep to the script, so I'd like to get interrupted. I'd like to encourage you to put up your hand if you like during it. What I say, if there's a term I use that you need to find or there's a question because you want to go a little bit deeper, there's a lot I can share, and I kind of had to pick before meeting all of you what you might want to hear about. So I'm going to do my best, but I'd love to get interrupted. So I actually would like you all to practice. I'm going to introduce myself again. I want you all to throw up your hands as if you have a question. Okay? Hi, my name is Barry Joseph. I come from Global Kids in New York City. Ooh. Okay, all right. I'm going to give you a second chance. I want everyone's hand to shoot up in the air because there's some question you imagine. I'm not going to call on you. Don't worry. We're going to pretend that there's some question you have to ask. My name is Barry Joseph. I come from Global Kids in New York City. All right, excellent. Sounds good. Now we can continue. Now, Kevin earlier talked about some of the incredible work going on by educators in Second Life. We learned some very specific details of one particular program. Kathy did a beautiful job talking about the specifics of what it's like to be in Second Life and what educators need to learn to be in that space. Uh, I'll take your question in one moment. Oh, collect up. Thank you. Excellent. I'm going to tell you why you, you shouldn't go into Second Life and why you shouldn't bring Second Life into your programs. And if you do choose to ignore my advice, I'm going to recommend some ways that you can start, some of the resources that are out there that you could use. But first, they have to go through the kind of, you know, standard, where am I coming from and what's my background to be even addressing these things. So let me tell you first about where I work, Global Kids. Global Kids' mission is to transform urban youth into successful students and global and community leaders by engaging them in socially dynamic, content-rich learning experiences. We're almost 20 years old and work in schools around New York City. So pretty much, we just like to play hard and have fun. I, for the last eight years, have been directing Global Kids Online Leadership Program. We focus uh, working with young people in person and online through web-based dialogues, socially conscious gaming, social networks for social good, virtual worlds, which brings me here today, focusing on inspiring youth in New York and around the world around global and public affairs. If you want to learn more about our work, holymeatballs.org, long story, it's our blog. We've over 2,000 posts, most of them by the youth in our programs, talking about the work that we're doing. It's a great resource to find out about what we're doing, and we're revamping it this summer. Maybe it'll move from a blog to a social network, but we'll see. And if you want to watch the videos, that's the main thing I recommend. Go to youtube.com slash holy meatballs. That's our channel there, and we have videos of our work. And as many people asked me before, and as some other people I've heard ask, have asked others, how can we see this stuff in Teen Second Life without going in? And the only way is to really look at people's videos. So we have a lot of videos you can check out. So w what do we do in, in uh, virtual worlds? And I say virtual worlds, I'm going to mostly be speaking about Second Life today, but we also do work in Wyville and there.com and are exploring the other spaces that are emerging as well that have spaces for education. We work primarily with uh, school, youth after schools in New York City, either in their schools in the daytime, in the after school setting, or in our offices in, New in Manhattan, uh, often doing what we think of as media projects. There's digital media projects, making animated movies, making uh, socially conscious games. But we also work with youth who are within the virtual world, youth we'll never meet. Youth who tell us they're from the U.S. or 
they're from Spain or they're from, from Mexico City. And we get to work with them in this environment, which is their play space. So it's very different than the after school programs because it's, they're coming into an adult space when it's after school. But when it's in a virtual world, it's their play space and our workspace have to overlap. We also work remotely in a distance learning way when youth are with an adult together somewhere else, such as in DC at a high school, but we can remotely uh, co-facilitate or even run on our own that program. Um, finally, we do professional development services, which is uh, much of what I'll be talking about uh, or mentioning ways that you can connect yourself with, and we do simulcast. You saw some examples from Kathy's presentation of bringing videos into Second Life. Those were canned videos, but you can also bring in live videos as well. We bring in live events like this into virtual worlds. Many people do that. There are all sorts of educational opportunities. And we also bring individuals in who will be sitting on the screen with an avatar, and you can be talking with them and hearing what they have to say. So just to give you a sense of who we partner with, to give you a range of the type of work that we're doing and what's possible in the space, really, um, we work with the MacArthur Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Microsoft Corporation, Motorola Foundation, UNICEF, National Youth Leadership Council, doing service learning, uh, Ashoka, specifically with their Youth Venture Arm, which is uh, youth social entrepreneurial projects, uh, the U.S. National Holocaust Museum, and the Field Museum. And I have to say, every single one of these projects are all completely different. The type of range uh, uh, that's allowed in, in a, a rich virtual world environment is, is fairly remarkable. So I'm going to pretty much talk about two things. First, I'm going to serve you up some best practices from our work, and then some educational resources. Okay? So, as I promised earlier, I want to start with recommending don't bring virtual worlds into your classroom. Don't do it. Because if you do, you risk having students who are incredibly enthused and engaged. You're going to be working with youth. Let's see if this video works. Logs and computers. They're the new ABCs. Who are using constructivist learning. Students being now creative. Doing science on and doing stuff like this. Thanks with what cool at school this week. Think of it as two classrooms in one. One's real, but the other's a virtual world this science class has grown to love. The possibility that everyone should do anything. All thanks to Second Life, an online program from teen group Global Kids. Simple keystrokes carry students from their seats to a world where anything's possible. We can teleport and they can fly. In more ways than one, say teachers. I have one of my students who wasn't necessarily as successful last semester who is thriving. A 21st century take on learning, gaining ground here at Brooklyn Global. Justin Finch, News 12 Brooklyn. Engagement, creativity, constructivist learning, 21st century learning skills, and, and this can't be emphasized enough, not just virtuals in themselves, but a way to connect to the larger internet ecology. This, for example, is a comic book made by one of those students you just saw on that news broadcast. It looks like Second Life, but you also see a comic balloon. So in Second Life, this student took the photo of himself. Let me read what it says. Hi, everybody. I'm Brandon, AKA Little Red Riding Hood with wings. I don't know where that came from. Okay, I'm gonna teach you all how to make prims. As you heard from Kathy, prims are the little basic building blocks, the little Lego blocks, you know, in Second Life. And the last part's my favorite. Oops. Yeah. So, this student had to design themselves, modify it. This was a red riding hood object. Take a photo on their screen, move it up to Flickr, take it from Flickr into a comic book, digital comic program, output it, and then put it up on their blog. And so I took it off of the blog. So when we talk about uh, using virtual worlds, it's not like they live in their own little isolated box. They're a window onto the larger participatory media space. So why do I recommend not uh, using Second Life unless you want these things? Because they're a pain in the neck. They really are, for a number of reasons. There's the firewalls, and we heard about some of those things earlier, right? Which is a combination of just getting onto Second Life within your school. Even if the school wants it, the, 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 the uh, larger school district might prevent access to a space like this. Or even if you can get through it, your computers might not be powerful enough. They might not look like this. All right, but problems always occur. Just like as you saw earlier, we had to start about a minute late, right? Because we had some tech problem. Well, imagine if it's not one, but 15 or 20 different computers. Something's always going on, whether getting online, right? Or, or figuring out what's wrong with one particular computer because the rest are all working. And you're just there, maybe there's two of you that are there. Who's gonna do the tech support while you're doing it? Uh, you heard um, a term earlier, res, from Kathy. Res is, is how something, is a term we use in Second Life, but something appears from nothing. And what you're seeing here is lag. 
You see how in the, the bottom left, it kind of looks nice. There's some trees and there's some water, but the background is just flat gray. There's lag, which means nothing's resing. It's just taking a really long time. And if I got on right now, I would be doing pretty good. But if we all went to exactly the same place I am right now, this server that's hosting this space is sending the same space to all of us, and it all will just slow down. So when we bring in 15 students, we're just pushing it. When we bring in 20, you're going to have a problem. And finally, uh, you can read the cartoon yourself. If you start using Second Life in virtual worlds in your programs, your colleagues, your peers, your friends might stop understanding what you're talking about. Right? Nonetheless, we found it incredibly valuable using these kind of environments for education. If in the Q&A you want to ask about any of the ones we talked about earlier, let me know, but I'm kind of picking as the theme of the science program. This is a high school class, a freshman level class of uh, 16 students that are learning basic science, focusing on sustainability issues, how to think critically from a scientific perspective, with an educator in the classroom, but every day they go into Second Life and these other broader internet tools that we talked about to both learn about the issues, and you'll see in a moment how they're learning it, and demonstrating what they're learning. It's the place where they're showing it. Okay, so we'll watch the video. This is, oh, so I should also mention there's another educator, and that educator is in Scotland, and we have a laptop like this on one of the tables, and with Skype, the rest of the students can see her face and hear her, and through the mic she hears them. And so she's in the room on a computer, but when the students go into Second Life, her avatar is there, and she's the one in the world helping them out. So this is uh, one of those educators doing a little short video for the first sustainability project. Right now, these are design buildings, but these were all blank when this exercise started, and I'll let uh, this Kathy explain. Hi, this is Kathy from Global Kids and the Science and Second Life Project. As you can see, we have many students busy working. After some time, looking at the topic of sustainability and their own carbon footprints, they are now working in teams to build and modify houses to reflect the building materials in their own real-life homes. They are also showing data from their own homes in signs that give information when touched. Signs include information about water and power use, garbage and recycling, and food products. Like this one, for example. Students will be adding to this information as they discover new information that can help them make better environmental choices. So until next time, this is Kathy for Global Kids and the Science and Second Life Project. This was the first module that lasted two weeks. The second module took the youth to a simulation of Milan where they're having a terrible garbage crisis. Does anyone know about that? I learned about it through the development of this curriculum. This was news to me. Massive problems with the garbage, and yet it's also a tourist destination. So like there were buildings here, there was a simulation of Milan where the students could go through it, and there were what are called NPCs, non-player characters. A human wasn't behind the avatar, it was just like an image, but it was connected to a database where you can talk to that NPC, and the database could hear what was being said and then respond. So the students went around interviewing townspeople, someone who was in the police, someone who ran a store, to learn about what the problem was and what they can do about it. And they then developed an action plan about what could be done. They went and then measured the garbage dump in the back. And they learned how people go to garbage dumps and find out what can be recyclable and what can't. And uh, that, that module just ended. And they're now go, they're learning about um, coal mining. And they're finding out what happens with strip mining, all within this space. And again, using tools like Flickr, blogs, digital comic books to both display what they've learned, which is then assessed. So if you don't take my advice and you do decide that you're interested in using some of these incredible tools, the first thing I want to talk about is the Global Kids curriculum, which is actually coming out this month. This is me kind of flipping through some of the pages, and there's some examples uh, uh, over here at the end. This is 134 lesson plans that go through all the basics that you need for learning everything. Like Kathy said, how do you look at the back of your head? Right, all the basic stuff you need to know. And it's essentially designed as handouts that can then be incorporated to teach other topics. So the science curriculum that you just saw is a science curriculum that uses the second life curriculum and incorporates it at different points. But it doesn't need to be just used for science. It can be taught to develop global citizen skills, as Global Kids uses it, or to teach English. And what we'll be doing very shortly is offering this curriculum both as something that one can make, have available to be used in your own programs or professional development trainings that will be offered at a variety of conferences and at our locations in New York City. We just launched ResEd last week, ResEd.org, and there's the URL at the bottom, and I know some of you are at computers. Please sign up now. I'd love to see how many people come from the room. ResEd is the first hub for learning in virtual worlds. 
There are some excellent, excellent resources for virtual worlds online, a lot of great stuff for academics, but there isn't a place for practitioners, and there hasn't been for some time. How can we get some of the great pra best practices we're hearing today from the people who are doing it? How can we hear from the people in the field who are impacting this, this, this kind of work? Both the people who are doing it in the schools, in the libraries, in the museums, the parents working with their youth at home, and the people who are creating these corporate environments. Right? How can we um, find out about what events are going on? Again, these specific things are out there in different places. Res Ed is about creating a community of people who can bring it all in one place. And I think we have about 250 people who signed up just in the last week. Uh, many people come from Second Life because that's the largest educator community out there. About 5,000 people organized on the SLED listserv. But there are people using a variety of virtual worlds and other spaces like that, like Worlds of Warcraft. And this is a new community to bring folks like that together. If anybody here is interested in writing best practices for it, uh, moderating discussions during the week, please let us know. Finally, we have the SLCC reports. Uh, SLCC stands for the Second Life Community Convention. Uh, it was originally a, a, a fan created space, but over the years as, as Second Life's become more professional with corporations and universities coming in, I think there's about maybe 250 universities at this point, if someone has a better number let me know, uh, a lot going on uh, in that space. It feels like more of a convention, uh, a conference at times. So the, the educator thread is you know, peer reviewed, educator submitted reports, um, and what we did, uh, and we have some copies here, and they're all available for free online as well on our website, are two reports. One is an overview of everything that the educators share that is going on in high schools, K through 12 training, with best practices that they recommend. So it's just a great overview of what's going on. It can be both informative for yourself and the kind of thing to educate someone who might be an administrator who you know, is trying to get a sense of you know, how valid is this field, what, what's really going on in this area. We also have one for, about nonprofits as well, if that would be of interest. Um, the Second Life Community Conference will be in Tampa this year. If anyone's interested, I'll let you know. It's the first week of September. Not the best time for educators, but uh, it should be an interesting conference. It's going to be an education thread once again, and a second thread, whoop, a second thread that's all about hands-on training, uh, which Global Kids is proud to be sponsoring this year. So I want to keep uh, what I had to say brief, so you can get a sense of the background, the kind of things that, that uh, uh, I could be addressing during the Q&A, because mostly I want to hear from all of you when we get to the Q&A period and hear what you're trying to learn about and what you can understand and how we, the panelists, can help you. Um, thank you very much. Hi everyone, good to see you. Uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to share some of your time today to talk a little bit about emerging technologies in schools. Um, I am a director of technology at a school district. I'm going to talk a little bit more about my school district uh, in a little bit. Um, and what I want to talk about is how to engage your teachers um, with the, all of the things that we've been talking about today. I think I have a cartoon that summarizes my entire presentation. Not sure if you can see that, but uh, complicated equation, and in the middle it says, then a miracle occurs, and the guy says, I think you need to be more explicit in step two. So all of us who are in K-12 and many of us who are in higher ed, I think we're at step two. You know, we're sitting there on the left is um, unbelievable emerging technologies that have created a global network. All the information in the world, all human knowledge, and the people who can teach it to you. You can connect to all of them anytime, anywhere, with small portable devices. On the right, on the other side, are these unbelievable schools that take advantage of all these tools in really seamless ways. And then there's the middle. And that's where we all are. We're sitting there going, yeah, there's blocking, and there's filtering, and I don't have time for professional development, and I really don't have much money, and the teachers aren't all as interested in it as the people in this room. Um, what do I do? You know, like, where do I go from here? Um, and that's really, I, I live in that space. I'm like one of those really nerdy guys who loves to live in the space of how do you get people to do things that they would really love to do if they only knew they wanted to do it. <laughs> 
Now the problem is, is that not only do we have to worry about the emerging technologies there are today, you know, just kind of arguing here for how big of a task is before us, um, things are accelerating. Um, I heard a great statistic um, that um, I think illustrates the acceleration that somebody previously talked about in terms of emerging technologies. 90% of all the scientists and engineers that have ever lived in the history of the world are alive today. Um, and that's because the world population is growing so rapidly and countries are developing so rapidly to, uh, science and technology programs um, that 90% of the engineers ever um, to have lived are alive today. And they're creating things at an exponential pace. I mean, we've gone from 1998 to 2008 to potentially 2018. So 2018, I was, I was at a conference in San Francisco in September. And at that conference, it was a, a conference for developers of artificial intelligence. And they were fairly confident that they could create a computer with human level intelligence um, by 2018 that they could create an online avatar that you could interact with on Second Life, and you wouldn't know whether you were interacting with a computer or whether you were interacting with a human being. Okay, so 2018 is not that far away. I mean, how many people remember 1998? You know? <laughs> it really doesn't seem that long ago, does it? I mean, you know, um, I think I can remember the World Series that year. Um, 2018 is going to be here really fast with some technologies that are going to develop that are, that are really going to make our heads spin. And I think we're all scratching our heads as to how to get all of our schools and all of our teachers and all of our administrators and all of us technologists, we're not exempt, just up to 2008 at this point. So how do you do that? Well, I, I, I'm personally a big fan of, of change management research. I, I do a lot of reading in change management. By no means am I an expert. I'm, I'm a practitioner who takes advantage of a lot of things. And I read a great study um, that was done on heart patients at uh, Johns Hopkins. And they took people who um, had blockages that were so bad, and they said to them, um, look, um, it is very, very possible that if you don't change your lifestyle within the next two years, you will die. And there's actually a guy by the name of Alan Deutschman, who writes for Fast Company, who wrote a book on this. It's called Change or Die. And, uh, and these were the methods that the Johns Hopkins researchers looked at, that doctors were using to try to get people to change. And he calls them facts, fear, and force. You know, one thing they would say to them would be, uh, you know, you have to change because, you know, I, I can show you that 95% of the people who don't adopt a lifestyle of exercise and don't change your diet and don't, you know, stop all the stress, you die. And, and they would say, you know, this is going to be really terrible for your family, and, and you're not going to be here anymore. And then they would even, like, enroll them in these mandatory programs, you know, that, that would, you'd have to take a part of. And you know what the success rate was on that program after two years? Anyone want to take a guess? How many? What percent? What percent of people changed after two years? Five percent. Okay, so we have people who have done change management before. Yeah, ten percent. <laughs> It was 10%, 90% of the people in the Johns Hopkins study over a period of two years had made no significant change in their lifestyle whatsoever. Um, you know, this is something that I hear a lot when I go to technology conferences. I hear people standing up, not today, today has been you know, a very reasoned discussion about this, but sometimes you go to a technology conference and what you hear is people banging away at the pulpit saying, you need to get into the 21st century. Because if you don't get into the 21st century, you're not going to have a job as a teacher. And you're not going to be able to keep up with where your kids are. And all your kids are going to be bored. Um, it's not going to work. Um, these kinds of professional development, you know, mandatory professional development, the one day in service that's supposed to get everybody excited about technology. What do we know works? Well, we know what works is there was another researcher who did a study on heart patients over a three-year study. And he found that active role, teaching, and support does this sound familiar? It comes out of our classrooms, right? Um, if you can get the people engaged in the study, uh, sorry, engaged in, the, um, in, the, uh, in this particular case, it was heart patients, um, to take an active role. Ask them, what do you want out of this? You know, what is it that you want? Um, if you can provide teaching for them, and if you can provide copious amounts of support, his success rate with those heart patients, same pilot study, was around 79%. Um, so how does this translate into schools? Well, for me, it translates into a technology project that looks something like this. You've got 
a change management proportion of the project that is an active role. That's where teachers and students and other people actively participate in defining the project. This is what I want in my classroom. This is how I want to learn. Now, will they be able to do that right off the bat? No, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. But that's the role they need to play. Um, professional development and customer support should be half the project. And the technology part, you know, the hardware and, and which doodads we're getting, and, and that's, that's, I gave 20%. Honestly, I, I sometimes thought about it, and I thought, you know, I could even give an argument for maybe 10%. We could add maybe 10% of evaluation for this. Um, as most of you know, if you've ever worked in schools, um, this isn't usually the composition of a technology project. Very often, a technology project looks like this. Um, you know, myself as director of technology sits down with the superintendent. Uh, we decide that it would be really great for every teacher to have a laptop, um, or that maybe you should have five computers in every classroom. Um, we provide change management active role, we provide you with the opportunity to determine which day you want to sign up for the one day professional development. That's your active role. Um, you get one day of professional development and if you have any problems using the laptop in the classroom, um, send an email to helpdesk at so and so and we'll get to you as soon as we can. Okay? If, if you are in the middle of someone developing a technology project like this, do me a favor. Go into their office and say to them, hey, I heard we're about to spend 1.2 million on this upcoming laptop project and this is the way it's structured and I have an idea. Let's instead go out into the middle of the street and just burn the money. Let's just dump it in the middle of the street and light it on fire because we'll get a lot more out of it in terms of press and <laughs> we'll, we'll all have a lot of fun and we won't put teachers and students through a whole lot of trouble for no reason whatsoever. And we won't all be standing here in four or five years saying, boy, that's, it just seemed like such a good idea. And, and now these laptops, and they're four or five years old and no one seems to be using them that much. I mean, well, they're using Microsoft Word and we're looking up things on the internet and you know, we're doing a little bit of uh, PowerPoint, but you know, it just, it doesn't seem to, these teachers, I mean, I don't know what's wrong with them. You know, they just they don't seem to be doing what they should be doing with these computers. Okay, so now I've thrown enough stones. Uh, I, I live in a glass house, by the way. I mean, I'm a technology director, so by no means am I suggesting that I've found the perfect process, and by no means am I suggesting that 100 and Central is doing everything right. Uh, I just want to get that clear off, off the top. But we've had a five-year process in place where we've tried to do things differently. We made a lot of mistakes along the way, and, and I'm more than willing to share the warts in the hopes that uh, we can help other people not uh, commit the same ones. But what we've done over five years is we've created a culture at 100 and Central where about 40% of the teachers in their classrooms at this point are actively using tools like wikis, podcasts, Skype, blogging, and things like that. And you, know, you might say 40%, well that's not even half. Um, it's a lot for us. You know, we're, we're shooting for 100% someday, and we're driving toward that. I think we're going to cross the halfway mark next year. We've got world language teachers who are um, doing Skype with uh, Ecuador, um, talking to them about um, what it's like um, for uh, rainforest uh, policies um, in terms of the, there was the um, head of environmental services for Ecuador agreed to Skype with our kids. Um, great uh, culminating assessment in, in two of our foreign language classes in Spanish where you have to call a uh, uh, hotel in Mexico via Skype, pretend that you're um, planning a trip to Mexico coming up and you have a 20 minute conversation that you have to record in Skype about asking the people at the hotel, at the concierge, um, you know, like what kind of beaches do you have and what are the restaurants like and stuff like this. You have to record it and submit it as your final assessment. I just thought that was one of the coolest things. Upper left hand corner there, a picture of Michael Vitez. He's an award winning uh, Philadelphia Inquirer reporter. He was invited to blog with our kids in a journalism class about their stories. So they wrote blogs about um, journalism stories that they were doing and Michael Vitez came on and asynchronously conversed with them over a period of two weeks about what it's like to be a journalist and what he thought of their stories. We've done this with um, The Secret Life of Bees, the author of that uh, book, Sue Monk Kidd. 
um, blogged with our kids for a couple of weeks. There's been a number of sort of, you know, relatively famous people who, when you, we find that when educators write them and say, hey, would you do some stuff with our kids, they're more than happy to. Do a lot of podcasting with social studies, do a lot of wiki work in our uh, English classes, so. Um, this is an example of, we do a lot of tracking of uh, survey information. Um, we asked teachers uh, four years ago, what role does technology currently play in your classroom teaching? The red lines are the benchmark from four years ago, and the green, purple, and blue lines are the, um, I'm going to talk about a tablet PC program, they're the classes of tablet PC um, teachers who have come on board over a period of a three-year implementation. So you can see that about 50% of our teachers thought there was no role or a small role for technology five years ago. And now, no matter which class they were in, about 80% about of them believe that there's a large role or a very large role. Um, I'm sure every like, higher education statistical person in here is just shaking their head going, oh my god, that's like the most unscientific study in the world. Um, it is, uh, it's really terrible. Um, but it's, it's the kind of surveys we do. We, we put out surveys to our whole teaching staff. We've got 250 teachers. We get about a 90% response rate, so we have a, a fairly high response rate. Um, and we, this is how we track how things are changing. And it's up to the point now where we actually have about 100 questions on that survey, and the teachers actually look forward to taking it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So how do we do change management? Um, there's a district educational technology team at our district. Hunter and Central is a single school, 3,200 student, 250 teacher district. Okay, so we're on 100 acres um, in New Jersey, and you know it's like a small community college or small liberal arts college is sort of the uh, the, the feel of it. Um, the district educational technology team makes all the decisions for the district. Any important educational technology decision goes through this team. It's half teachers. It's 25% department supervisors who still teach. So 75% of this team is still in the classroom. And I think that's really, really critical to making technology decisions that actually are going to change teaching and learning. Um, there's 25% that's parents, supervisors, and teachers. Uh, or sorry, parents, administrators, and technologists. Um, and we have a separate student team that has about 25 students on it um, that meets in a separate venue. We found that it was, it was difficult, honestly, to have the students, you know, have one or two students on the team out of 3,200 trying to provide feedback. It just didn't work. So we have a separate student team, but this is the team um, that drives a lot of our decision making. And our student team tends to act as a review body and a place where we generate new ideas. Um, this is the goal of the team, to create and support a systemic environment where all teachers voluntarily and continuously improve teaching and learning through the use of emerging technologies. That's, that's the goal of the team vis-a-vis -vis the teachers, okay? Um, these are some driving questions. So what we, what we put in place four years ago on the recommendation of that team um, was a tablet PC program. Um, this tablet PC program has been really transformational for our district, and I want to emphasize that. I, you know, this may or may not be the right kind of program for you. For our district, it was really terrific. Um, what, it, what it was was a program where teachers would get um, a tablet PC along with a wireless projector and a multimedia stack for their classrooms, um, and then be given a lot of professional development and support um, to use that. The professional development was mandatory, not voluntary. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and the support was completely redesigned by the interactions that we had with the educational technology team and the teachers. Uh, program participation in the first year was 13%. We had 33 volunteers for the program out of 250 teachers. The second year, it was 81%. Um, we had our teachers who were in that program present to the rest of the teachers halfway through the year on what they were doing with the tablets and instruction. And four out of five teachers said, oh, I I'm all over that. I, I can't do that quickly enough. And then the third year, we had 98% uh, of our teachers volunteer for the program. It's still a voluntary program. There are still six teachers <laughs> at Hunter and Central who do not use tablets. And let me tell you, they never will. 
Um, <laughs> they have made that clear to me. Um, you know, 244 out of 250, nothing. Um, this is another benchmark that we use. How included do you feel in the process of choosing technology in your, your, for your use? About two thirds of the teachers, the red bar, felt pretty uh, uh, uninvested. 60% or so, 60 some percent felt like, you know, I'm not really included in this. Um, we find the longer you've been in the Tablet PC program, the more professional development you've taken, and the more that you teach technology courses, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, um, the more that they feel invested in the process. Um, professional development. So under our old system of professional development, we had a lot of one-shot professional development uh, where the program was mandatory, but the professional development was voluntary. So we would say to people, for example, there are going to be five computers in every classroom. If you want to learn how to use them, it's up to you. You know, um, The teachers told us, you've got this completely wrong. It's, it's upside down. You know, it should be, you know, the technology is optional, but if you're going to take part in the technology, you must take part in the professional development. Used to be that we had the IT department or outside consultants prepare and teach the curriculum. The teachers pointed out to us that we have 250 people on campus who are really good at this. Um, and they are paid now to design the curriculum and to teach the courses. Um, the number of teachers we have instructing technology courses has gone from 20 to about 42 to about 66 over the course of three years. These are teachers who provide up to a three-day um, technology uh, class for their peers. And it's our goal, again, within the next year to go to about half of the faculty giving technology courses to the other half, um, and hopefully beyond. Customer support. Um, the old system, the really, the burden, the, to sum it up in one word, or in one sentence, I mean, um, the burden was on the teacher. You had to know who to call for support. You had to know what part of the building you were in. Oh, it's this person who's responsible for supporting that part of the building. You'd call, you'd leave a voicemail, that person wouldn't be in. So, and, and the teachers came to us and they said, listen, if you want us to use technology, you have to provide support when we need it, like exactly in the classroom when we need it. And I said to them, I said, how fast do we have to get to your classroom? They said, within 10 minutes. If, if I have a full lesson plan, and I'm, we have 80 minute blocks at our school, I'm gonna be teaching for the next 80 minutes, I get up and right off the bat something goes wrong, and now I've got 80 minutes with my class and the technology's not working, I need you there within 10 minutes. So I said yes, and then I went back to my technology staff, and they um, really freaked out. They said, uh, you know, there's no way we're gonna be able to support this. Um, I also promised the teachers that they could define the situation as an emergency. So in other words, when you call the desk, it wouldn't be the IT person who says to you, well, that's not an emergency, I'll be by tomorrow. If you say it's an emergency, then it's an emergency, and we have to be there in 10 minutes. Um, so I told my staff not to panic, um, and that this thing would work itself out. Um, that we were providing professional development and support that's educative. And over time, the numbers are going to drop. The number of people defining things as an emergency and the number of people who need that kind of emergency support is going to drop as teachers get better and better at doing their own troubleshooting. <laughs> Luckily for me, that's what happened. <laughs> um, these are the percentage of help desk calls in our tracking system that are identified by an, as an emergency by the teacher. 23% the first year, 16% the second year, 9% the third year. So it dropped by, by almost a third um, by the third year, the number of help desk calls that were defined as an emergency. The actual number of calls dropped precipitously. It went from 7.61 per teacher down to 2.34 um, this, past, this past year. It's a huge drop, huge drop. And why is it? Because now, three years of professional development three years of educative support, they can help each other, they can troubleshoot all the simple stuff. We're getting the really interesting calls right now. You know, we're getting the calls like, boy, I'd really love to do this kind of virtual world project. How would I do that? You know, I said to my staff, this is where we want to get. You know, we want to get those kinds of calls. How well supported do you feel by the information systems department? About a third of the people uh, four years ago said, I just don't really feel that supported. 
And now we've got about 70 to 80% of the people who say, I feel really well supported by the department. So that's my, uh, that's my take on step two, um, the whole change process um, at Hunter and Central. Um, I'd love to be able to talk more to you sometime about uh, uh, various nuances of that process, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks a lot. You've been a very patient group. Uh, before we close, I'd like to know, are there any questions you have for any members of this panel? They're here. Anything you might want to know? Yes. Barry, you want to come? How much money? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so, so the question was, how much money did you have to put into all this? Um, it's really not the amount, because the amount's going to change from place to place. But the really important part is where are you going to get it? You know, like in other words, how are you going to fund this? Um, we did three things to try to fund teacher professional development. We started a tablet PC academy at Hunter and Central that was taught by our teachers. And we take the money from teaching teachers from around the world about tablet PCs, and we put that back into teacher professional development. Um, the second thing we've done is we have um, offered out shared services to other schools um, so that other schools can use our student information system and other for, a, for an annual fee. And the third thing that we've done is we've gone ahead and rented space in our uh, storage room and we've applied for a lot of grants. So at this point, when I came in, um, the technology department was 100% expense. And now we are about 33% of that is revenue. So what I've argued to the board is, is you know, the more money you give me, the more money I'll make. Um, and so this has been a very compelling way to increase the budget. Thank you. Question up here, Dirac. Yeah, so the tablet PC program at this point has uh, 325 people in it. 250 or so are teachers and about 75 are administrators and staff. Our buildings and grounds crew walks around the campus with tablet PCs, marking off work orders and doing things like that. Our administrators are sitting there in observations, filling out observation sheets by hand sometimes with the tablet and then converting handwriting into text. So there's all kinds of uses for it that go beyond the classroom. But the Tablet PC Academy, the three-day conference that we run during the summer, focuses um, really on curriculum and instruction and how a technology staff could implement a program like that. Shout it out from the back. So if you ask anyone in corporate, they're going to tell you 80, 80 PCs to one support person. That's considered to be a benchmark. If you ask anyone in schools, they'll tell you it runs somewhere between 500 and 1,000. <laughs> there you go, 1,200, 1,200 to her. So I, I think that you know we have four people who support 3,200 teachers. So we're on a 1 to 800. Um, and. Uh, it's, it's very challenging, you know, to get everything done. I mean, in an ideal world, at this point, I think anything you argue for, you have to argue from the corporate number. Go get the corporate numbers on the web and start to make those arguments and explain to people that a lot of those corporate numbers, too, are people who are working in a real nine to five environment. And, you know, we're providing support for teachers pretty much around the clock sometimes. No problem. Thank you very much. Lisa, do you want to say goodbye to everybody? There was a question? No? Yes, one last question. Just to clarify, is that 3,200 students or 3,200 Yeah, that's a good point. It's, it's 3,200 students, but then we have 700 people who work on campus because we run a bus depot and like all this part-time people and stuff like that. So really, we provide support for about 4,000. Uh, Computer-wise, it's about 1,800 machines. Kevin. I was wondering if you could tell everybody about your experience with the Baldrige Quality Initiative. Yeah, uh, so Hunter and Central is a Baldrige school, which, uh, if some of you know, it's a system of, uh, of uh, 
Yeah, excellence, yeah, system of process. Um, it's really, um, if any of you have heard of Six Sigma or, or anything along these lines, it's a way of decision making. And I, the heart of it for me is that I've been inspired by, by the Baldrige system, I came on board at Hunter and Central five years ago, and when they told me about the shared decision making process in the interview, that it was expected that every member of the organization take part in major decisions of the school and contribute to that, in a significant way. That was the part that I really latched onto for the technology portion, and that's been really important. So if any of you are interested, um, you can go to, uh, uh, Google uh, Malcolm Baldridge uh, quality, and uh, you'll, you'll see the Baldridge site, and you can go take a look at that. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We have a closing remark from Cecilia Rose, who is going to uh, thank us and say goodbye. Hi, my name is Cecilia Rouse. I'm uh, the, the director of the Education Research Section and a senior editor at the Future of Children. And I'm sorry I couldn't actually participate as much today as I had, had wanted to, but there was an event I had to attend at my daughter's school. So there was my mommy hat and my school hat. Um, but I'll tell you that um, this event is the really the, is sort of the highlight of our year in the Education Research Section. And I can always tell how, how, how successful we've been at it by the number of people who are left at the very end. And by that measure, I can tell that this year's event was really fabulous. And I could tell that from the speakers I heard. Um, I think the topic was just really exciting and really interesting. Um, I want to encourage you to fill out your uh, feedback forms if you haven't already done so. We really do use them as we plan our next uh, year's uh, conference, which, as Lisa mentioned earlier, will be on high schools. Um, but before I close, really I want to just say that this conference is, you know, springs from the future of children, but it is really um, the creative energy and the person who really puts it together is Lisa Markman. She devotes a lot of time. She's there from the very beginning of the creation of the journal, so she's intimately familiar with the content of it. And then she really goes out and finds not only the geeky academics that contributed, but all the rest of you who are doing such exciting things in the schools. And so I just really want to give um, a round of applause for Lisa, because she's here. <laughs> but that said, nobody can do things on her, you know, on her own, as amazing as Lisa is. So we also want to thank John Webb and Teacher Prep. We want to thank Elizabeth and everybody else at the Future of Children. And we want to thank Jeannie Moore, Joyce Howell, and Charlotte, um, uh, Charlotte Howard, who also ably assisted Lisa in putting this together. And I mostly want to thank you for coming, because we're trying to, you know, th we, this was for you. And so I hope you found it interesting um, in, and that you'll take these back to your schools and let us know how that works. So thank you very much for coming.